All right, welcome back to part five, I believe uh, we are on now. We're gonna take a look at the non-steady state diffusion case. So we're gonna predict the concentration in a material uh, under the conditions where we no longer have this linear concentration gradient like we saw in Fick's first law. So we're gonna end up using what's called Fick's second law in this case. So if we take Fick's first law and we apply to it a conservation of mass, which is that the concentration in time is equal to uh, the negative of the gradient of the flux with position. And Charles is trying to explain what that is here in this picture in a second. But if we go ahead and combine those, then we'll go ahead and we'll get fixed second law. So dcdt is equal to the derivative of j, which is fixed first law. So take the derivative of that with respect to x. And so I'll get the second derivative here of concentration with position. And we made the assumption that D did not depend on position. So that was pulled out front. Okay, and that's not always the case, but it'll be the case for the problems that we're looking at here. All right, so let's see if we can kind of get to this mass balance equation a little bit. So let's say that this is represents a concentration profile through our solid. Okay, so we have some surface value, the concentration falls off in our solid, and then eventually, it plateaus to this value C0, which is the initial value of the concentration. Okay, so maybe this is a steel and it already has carbon in it. That's my C0 value. Uh, and I put it in a, an environment rich in carbon so that I can bring my surface up to some higher value and harden it. And then I, I apply heat and time to allow that carbon to start diffusing in to my steel. Okay, so initially, I don't have any of the new carbon in. And then with later time T1, it's starting to move in. T2, T3, I'm moving even further into my solid. All right, so let's just take a look at this T2 curve here and look at this one point. If I go ahead and just draw a little box here around this one point represented as here. Okay. I can ask, so this represents a point in my material. So at this particular position, I've got a flux coming in to this piece of material, and I'll have a flux that's also leaving this piece of material. And what I want to do is see which one of these fluxes is bigger. So if I just take a look at the slope here, right, because fixed first law says dc dx, the slope's what's important. Uh, what I can find is that the slope is steeper on this side than it is on this side, right? See how the slope is becoming less and less steep. And so my flux is actually bigger coming in than it is leaving. And the difference in these fluxes over the time step, and it's coming in an area, then gives me a kilogram. And so that tells me how much my concentration then in this volume has to increase with whatever that time step is. So my little volume element, the concentration goes up with my time step, and it goes up by the difference in the flux across this location. So that's dj dx. So that's kind of the physical idea of how that works. Uh, since the flux coming in is larger than the one leaving, then ultimately the concentration goes up in this little volume element. And so at a later time t, my value is going to be higher. So I get up here to my T3 curve. Okay, so that's the idea. But anyway, we get fixed second law. And we would need to solve that second order differential equation for whatever the conditions were for uh, the particular diffusion case that we had. So let's say that um, we were diffusing uh, copper into a bar of aluminum. So this is an aluminum bar. I have copper here. Uh, on the surface, and I'm going to diffuse it into this surface and then diffuse it this way, one dimensionally down the bar. Okay. So my surface concentration, Cs of copper, is shown here in, in this plot. Okay, so that's my surface. Uh, I could have some initial value, so that's represented out here. I have infinity here. My copper hasn't reached that far, so that's just my initial to continue this on. 
And then with time, we're going to end up with these profiles as I move more and more copper into this material. So my initial and boundary conditions are that at time equals zero, I have an initial value for all x. And then at time greater than zero, I set my surface to some fixed value, that's x equals zero for the surface. And I still maintain my c0 value when x is equal to infinity. Okay, so that just says over the time frame of my problem, I never reach the other side. So this doesn't have to be an infinite in thickness, it just needs to be um, thick relative to my time frame. So if I was to go ahead and solve those differential equations, I'd end up with this error function solution shown here. And in fact, this is a fairly simple problem. If we start moving the boundary conditions and initial conditions away from this one, we'll find that we can't solve them anymore analytically. And then we'd have to move into numerical solutions. But this one we can. So this is referred to as a semi-infinite diffusion problem. Um, this error function is a function that you'll find in Excel or MATLAB or Mathematica, um, sometimes on your calculator. This is the definition of it. But you're not going to have to do that. What we're going to do is calculate this value in here and then just find the error function like we would find sine or cosine or anything else. This is my concentration profile as a function of position and time, my initial value, and this is my surface concentration value. So if I'm given, uh, say, a diffusion coefficient, and I'm given a particular time that I'm interested in, maybe one hour, I could calculate then the concentration as a function of position. And that's what these curves are. Oops. All right. Um, this error function is also tabulated. So here is actually a tabulated value for it. So if you were to find this x over 2 square root dt value, and then we'll just call this z, that's the z here, you could look up the z value and go across and there's your error function. So the error function you can see goes from 0 to 1. So after uh, about 2.8, you can just call it 1 and it stays uh, at 1. So let's take a look at a quick example. So here we've got a, um, an iron carbon or steel. It has initially 0.28% carbon in it. That's my C0. Uh, surface concentration is at 1. That's my CS. My time is 49.5 hours. I need to put that in seconds. And the concentration, now it's telling us it's 0.35 at a position x equals to 4. So they're actually giving us this one, and they're giving us the position. What they haven't given us in this case is actually the diffusion coefficient. So that we can solve for. And it wants to know what the temperature is that this was carried out. Okay, well, there's no temperature in this equation, but recall that the temperature is the ambient mean equation for this. So once we find D, and then if we're given the free exponential and the, uh, that's D0, and we're given the activation energy Q, then we could find T. So here's my equations, my knowns. I'll go ahead and plug in. Okay. And in this particular case, I don't know D, so I can't calculate this and then go to my table. I have to use my table in reverse. Uh, I know these values right here. Okay. So I can bring that one over here and that'll all be 0.8125. So my error function, Z, is equal to the 0.8125. So then I could go to my table or my calculator and solve for what z gives me this. Okay, so I might have to do a little interpolation and I'll get a z of 0.93. And then remember z is this term x over 2 square root dt. I can solve for d. Everything else is given. I get 2.6 times 10 to the minus 11 meters squared per second. And then the last step, which I don't have on here, 
is if I go ahead and look in the table in your text, you'll see a value for the activation energy and the free exponential for carbon in iron. You can use that with the equation for the, diffuse, uh, for the diffusion coefficient, and you could calculate what the temperature has to be to give you this value. All right, that was a mouthful. So just a little summary for you. Generally, diffusion is faster for more open crystal structures. So that means lower density materials, or another way of saying it is low atomic packing factor. Okay, so you expect diffusion to be faster, say, for a body-centered cubic versus a face-centered cubic material if everything else is equal. Um, materials with weaker bonds allow things to move around in them much quicker than a material, say, with very strong bonds uh, that don't allow distortion of the lattice so easily. Smaller atoms tend to diffuse faster than larger ones. This was one of the mechanisms for interstitial diffusing, diffusion moving faster than vacancy. And then, of course, lower versus density it has to do with how much space is available uh, in the unit cell or atomic packing factor. 